4.3 is absolute extrema and the mean value theorem. So let's talk about what let's talk about the absolute extrema first. Uh, so when you say so there's a bunch of this is a bunch of definitions here, right? We have the absolute maximum, uh, which is also sometimes called a global maximum. So when you hear that word global and absolute, it's referring to the same thing. So the absolute maximum of a function is the y value that is greater than or equal to all the other y values on the function. So if you think of the y as the up and the down, it's the highest the graph ever gets to. That's the absolute maximum. The absolute minimum, or the global minimum, of a function is the y value that is less than or equal to all the other y values. So if you think about that, it's the lowest the graph ever gets. Relative maximum is or sometimes it's called the local maximum, is the y value is greater than or equal to all the nearby y values. Relative minimum is all the y values that are less than or equal to all the nearby y values. So extreme in general are referring to maximum or minimums. Okay, so a lot of times when you hear that word extrema, that's what it's talking about. Uh, you got the maxima, minimum, or minima values. Critical numbers, when we go to find... Um, relative maximums or absolute maximums, we have to find the critical numbers. So the critical numbers are defined as uh, their x values where the function exists, but the derivative either is zero or undefined. It's one of those two. So keep all those definitions in mind. We're going to use those a bunch throughout this lesson. Uh, keep them in front of you as we go through here. Make sure you're familiar with them. Uh, we're going to skip over this part. Uh, well, let's actually talk about the extreme value theorem. We're going to skip over this candidate test here in just a second. But the extreme value th theorem says if f is continuous from the, on the interval from a to b, including a and b, then f has both an absolute minimum and an absolute maximum. So if it's continuous and it includes the endpoints, it has to have a relative max or a relative minimum. To find that, we use this candidate test. I'm going to come back and talk more about that here in just a second. Um, but si as a side note here, it does say down at the bottom, absolute extrema can occur either at critical numbers or at endpoints. Um, relative extrema only occur at critical numbers. We do not consider uh, the endpoints when we're finding relative extrema. So just kind of keep that in mind. We'll talk more. We're going to talk a lot more about relative extrema actually in the next lesson. Um, but we'll, so we'll we'll kind of come back to that a little bit then. So here's just a really graph example. This helps with all the vocabulary words. So let's run down to this really quick. It says what is the absolute max of f? So again, that, that's saying what's the highest f ever gets? What's the highest value of the function we ever get back out? Uh, that is going to be right here at 4. 4 is the highest it ever gets. That's the, the highest value we ever get out of that function. Uh, what, is the x, uh, what x value does f obtain? That absolute maximum. So all that's saying is at that point, at that x, at, you know, when I get my max of 4, what is the x value? Well, that's a negative 4. And three, what is the absolute maximum point? So we include both of them. That'd be negative four, four. So those are three ways to ask really similar questions. You got to be careful and, and pay attention when you're answering these. You're answering correctly. If it asks for the absolute maximum or absolute minimum, that is the y value. That's the highest or lowest it gets. Uh, the second one, at what x value does it obtain the absolute maximum? So of course that's going to be the x value. And if it says what is the absolute maximum point? You've got to include both the x and the y. Number four, what is the absolute minimum of f? So this is kind of a trick question. Um, if I come down here, the lowest the graph ever gets is over here. The problem is, what is the lowest y value? Well, because that's an open dot, there, is, there isn't one, right? I could pick a point really close to negative 2. You could do negative 1.9, but there's always one closer to negative 2. I could say, well, what about negative 1.99? And... If I want to go past that, what about negative 1.99999? And I can keep finding numbers closer and closer to negative 2. So in this case, if, if it, the point is not included, that means that it cannot be a minimum. So what is the absolute minimum? Uh, the answer is it doesn't have one. Five, at what x values does f obtain a, rel obtain a relative maximum? So relative means the point, is, or sorry, relative minimum. It means the point is lower than all the points around it. So an example of that would be right here. Like that point is lower than all the points around it. Uh, so at what x value? That x value would be negative 3. Uh, let's see if there's any others. Actually, there's one more over here, right? At that point right there, it is lower 
then all the points around it. So that would be at x equals 1. Uh, at what x values does it have a relative maximum? So right here is 1. At that point, it's higher than all the points around it. That's when x equals negative 1. Be careful with this one. Because that's an open dot, the point has to be included to be an absolute, to be a relative maximum. Uh, so that point is not included, it's not a relative maximum. Also, the endpoints, that's what that note right above here says, right? Is this point, points, uh, the endpoints cannot be relative max or relative min. They can be absolute maximums and absolute minimums, but not relative. Okay, so we're going to go through and talk about if you're given a, a function without the graph, how do we tell what the relative, how do we find these absolute maximum and absolute minimums? And that's what this is for right here. And this, this box right here goes through the steps. So here's our procedures. The first thing you do is you find all the critical numbers. Remember, critical numbers are when the derivative is equal to zero or undefined. The second thing is you find the y values of each of those critical numbers and of the two endpoints. And then step number three is you simply look at it. Whichever one has the highest y value is your absolute max. Whichever one has the lowest y value is your absolute minimum. So let's go through a couple of examples here. Uh, let's find the global extrema. So global mean absolute, and extrema mean both max and min of that function, f of x equals one-third x cubed minus 2x squared. So we're going to find the critical numbers. So let's take the derivative. So the 3 drops down, 3 times a third x cubed minus 2 times 2x. So I end up with uh, x cubed minus 4x. Or sorry, x squared. Oops, sorry about that. The 3 drops down, subtract 1 from the power. So that would be an x squared right there. Okay, that is what my derivative equals. So to find the critical numbers, I want to make a list of all the critical numbers. I find out when the derivative is undefined. That, that function is never undefined. X can be anything. So then also find out when it's equal to 0. So let's find out when it's equal to 0. So x squared minus 4x equals 0. I can factor an x out of both of those. So I'd get uh, x equals 0. The derivative is equal to 0. And x equals 4. The derivative is equal to 0. So those are my two critical numbers. Okay, to actually find the max and min then, I take my endpoints. So I'm going to start with the negative 1 is my endpoint on the left side. And then I'm going to take my critical numbers, f of 0. And then my other endpoints, f of 3. Notice how that 4 is not on the interval. Like 4 is not between negative 1 and 3, so we're going to exclude it. Okay, we're going to take those three, plug them all into our function, the original function up above, and find out what we get. So if I plug negative 1 in, negative 1 cubes a negative 1 times a third is a negative 1 third. So it'll be a negative 1 third minus 2 times negative 1 squared is 1, so minus 2. So that comes out to be negative 2 and 1 third. K plug 0 in. That's a pretty easy one. It just comes out to be 0. Plug 3 in. 3 cubed is 27 times a third is 9. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. 9 minus 18 is a negative 9. Okay, we're just going to compare all of the y values then. So what is the, the on that interval from negative 1 to 3, the highest the graph ever gets is to 0 right there. So I would say it has a global maximum or an absolute maximum of 0. Okay, what's the lowest it ever gets to? Down to negative 9. So it has an absolute min, absolute min of negative 9. Okay. So, again, procedures. Find your critical numbers. You do that by taking the derivative and finding out when it's 0 or undefined. Okay. Then take your critical numbers and your endpoints. Plug them back into your original function. You want to find out what is the y value. So you've got to plug it into the original function to find those y values. And then just take the, the greatest one is your uh, max, the least one, the smallest one is your minimum. So here's another example. It says find the absolute max and min values of f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 2. Uh, we have an issue here. Uh, I don't know how to find the derivative of an absolute value. What we could do instead, though, is we can just look at the graph. So the, the graph of the absolute value of x minus 2 is shifted to the right, too. We know it's a V-shape. Um, so something like it starts at 0, goes to there, and then at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it hits its max point. 5 minus 2 is 3. 
So it's up here on a positive 3, you know, so something like that. And we can actually tell the absolute maximum just by looking at that graph. But let's go through the steps. So if I want to find my critical numbers, even though I don't know the derivative, I do know that this, the, the slope is undefined at 2. I have a sharp, the, the um, derivative is undefined because I have a sharp turn there at x equals 2. Uh, when is this equal to zero? That's never, right? This has a slope of a negative one, that has a slope of a positive one. So it's only critical number is two. So now I go back to my function, I do my endpoints, f of zero, I do my critical number, my other endpoint, plug all those in there. If I plug zero in, I get uh, zero minus two is negative two, absolute value is a positive two. Plug two in and I get zero. Plug five in and I get three. Okay, so the absolute uh, maximum would be two, so max, max of two, uh, min has a min of zero. Oh, I did that completely wrong. Sorry about that. The highest it gets to is three, as a max of three. Hopefully you were like shouting at me at your computer screen there that I was doing that wrong. Okay, as a max of three, the highest it ever gets is three, the lowest it ever gets is zero. And you can see that on the graph, right? This is the lowest point right there. That's the highest point right there. Okay, let's do this one. So find the extrema. So again, extrema mean if we're going to find the absolute max, absolute, absolute minimum of f of x equals 3x to the 2 thirds minus 2x. And our interval is from negative 1 to 3. Okay, let's find our critical numbers. So take the derivative. So f prime of x, drop the 2 thirds down. 2 thirds times 3 is 2. And subtract 1 from the power. Uh, derivative of 2x is 2. I'm going to rewrite it this way. So the derivative equals, move the 2 down to the bottom, or the, sorry, the x to the negative 1 third down to the bottom. I want to find out when that's undefined and when it's equal to 0. The undefined part's pretty easy. I'm going to, I'm going to do one more thing, actually. I'm going to write that x to the 1 third as being the cube root of x. It'll be easier to solve. Well, the only time it's undefined is if x equals 0. If I put 0 in for x, I have a 0 on the bottom of the fraction. So I'm going to start out. I know it's undefined at x equals 0, so that's one of my critical numbers. Okay, now I want to find out when the function, when the derivative equals 0. So 0 equals 2 over cubed root of x minus 2. Okay, so I'll solve that equation. I'm going to add the 2 over 2 equals 2 over the cubed root of x. Uh, you could times the cubed root of x over, so you get 2 cubed root of x equals 2. Divide by 2 you end up with the cube root of x, cube root of x equals 1, uh, so that would be 1. So I got 0 because it was, the derivative was undefined as 0, it gave me a 0 on the bottom of the fraction. I got the 1 because I set it equal to 0 and, and solved for that. So those are my two critical numbers. So to check this, I'm going to take f of my first endpoint, negative 1, f of 0, f of 1, and f of 3. I've got to plug all four of those back into my function and find out what y values I get back out. The largest one is the max, the smallest one's the min. So let's plug in negative one. Uh, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna rewrite it this way, my function. This is the same as three times the cubed root of x squared minus two x. So if I plug negative one and negative one squared is one, cubed root is one, one times three is three. Then I go minus 2 times negative 1. That would change to a plus 2. So I end up with 3 plus 2. So I end up with a 5 up over there. If I plug in 0, 0, 0, 0 minus 0, 0. If I plug in 1, 1 to the 2 thirds is 1. So it would be 3 minus 2. So I end up with a 1 right there. The last one's kind of tricky. If I plug 3 in, 3 squared is 9. Cube root of 9 is I have no idea. So I end up with 3 cubed root of 9 just be a cubed root there, sorry, cubed root of 9 uh, minus 2 times 3 is 6. Um, if you plug this in a calculator, it comes out to be something like point, I can't remember, I, I did it a second ago, but it's point two something. Okay, so I'm looking at these y values, which is my greatest y value? Uh, the greatest one is at 5. So I have an absolute maximum of 5. My minimum, this is point two something, it's a positive though, so my minimum would be right there at 0. So it'd be an absolute minimum of zero. Okay. So if I make a note of this, absolute max of five, absolute min of zero.
are my two answers on that one. So it can get a little crazy, but again, the steps are the same. Take your derivative, find out when your derivative is equal to zero and when it's undefined. Those give you your critical numbers. Then just take your endpoints and the critical numbers, plug them all into your function, and just check the y values. So this says find the global maximum minimum. This is the same thing. Global maximum min seems, means the absolute maximum, absolute minimum. This one's a little tricky. Um, same process, though. We've got to find our derivative. So I'm going to take that derivative. g of x is equal to derivative of 2 sine of x would be 2 cosine of x minus uh, derivative of cosine of 2x would be the negative sine of 2x times 2. I got times by the derivative of the inside. So that, this is g prime, sorry. So this is going to come out to be 2 cosine of x uh, minus a negative is plus 2 sine of 2x. Now I have to find out when that's undefined. Well, cosine never is, it, the domain's all real numbers. It's never undefined. Same with the sine of x. So we don't have to worry about being undefined, but I have to find out when it equals 0. Uh, this is a little bit tricky, but one thing that can make it easier is there's, there's actually what's called a double angle identity, which we didn't review, but you did that back in Math 3, which says if you have, uh, the 2 stays there, 2 times, and if you have the sine of 2x, so I have 2 times my angle on the inside, you can take that and rewrite it. It comes out to be uh, 2 sine of x cosine of x. So this is the same thing as that, and that's just a trig identity. The reason why that's helpful is because I want to find out when my derivative equals 0. Well, now I have a 2 cosine of x here and a 2 cosine of x here. I can factor that out. 2 cosine of x would leave me with 1 plus, I still have a 2 left over. So I took out a 2 cosine of x out of there and a 2 cosine of x out of there. And this is what I'm left with. So I, now I, I want to find out when they're equal to 0. So now it's factored. I can set each of those factors equal to 0. So I'm going to say 2 cosine of x equals 0, which really means divide by 2. So I want to find out when the cosine of x equals 0. Well, if you think of your unit circle, 0 is right, um, cosine of x equals 0, right? Sorry, equals 0 up here. So when the x-coordinate is 0. So at pi over 2, you get an x of 0. And 3 pi over 2, you get an x-coordinate of 0. So those are two of my critical numbers. I'm going to list those up there. I got a critical number at uh, x equals pi over 2 and x equals 3 pi over 2. But now I have this equation here, too. I need to set it equal to 0. So 1 plus 2 sine of x equals 0. So if I minus the 1 over and divide by 2, I end up with the sine of x equals a negative 1 half. So now I've got to figure out my intervals from 0 to 2 pi. I've got to figure out one would equal that. Well, the sine is negative here and here. So those are going to be my two reference triangles. And sine is the opposite, which is negative 1 over here, over the hypotenuse. It's so the same thing here would be negative 1 over 2. So you've got to figure out what triangle that is. Uh, well, that is the 30, 60, 90, right? This would be the square root of 3. This would be the square root of 3. What that means, I didn't draw my triangles um, very proportionally, but um, this is a short side over here, so this has to be pi 6, the 30 degree angle. So this would be 1 pi plus pi 6, that's 7 pi over 6. And this one would have to be all the way around. That's 1 and, a, that's one and 5, 6, so that ends up being 11 pi over 6. A lot of work there, right? That, that's just getting our critical numbers. Now, I've got to test all of those. So I've got I to go back and plug each of those in there and uh, find out what they come out to. So I'm going to need some space here. So I'm going to erase that. In fact, I'm going to erase this part over here. If you need a pause it, make sure you have it all written down. But I need to take all of those, including my endpoints, and plug them all into my original function and find out what I get. Uh, so I'm going to take the uh, g of 0, g of pi halves, uh, g of 7 pi over 6, g of 3 pi over 2, g of 11 pi over 6, and g of 2 pi. And I've got to plug each of those into my original function and find the y values. Yuck. Okay, so if I plug 0 into the sign, think of your unit circle, 
that's right there. The sine is equal to zero right there. So this would be two times zero. Um, the cosine of two times zero would still be zero. So the cosine of zero is one. So I get zero minus one. So that comes out to be negative one. Okay, do pi halves. So the sine of pi halves, that's up here. Uh, pi halves, that's one. So I get two times one is two minus the cosine of two times pi halves. Well, two times pi halves is just pi. The cosine of pi is over here. Uh, so it is a, x value is a negative one. So I get two minus a negative one. So it ends up being uh, two plus one. So it comes out to be three. All right, now we get to the really fun one, seven pi over six. So if I plug in seven pi over six, um, I'm going to have to draw my reference triangle for this one. Seven pi over six is over here. Uh, so this is that 30 degree angle. So this is negative one. This is two square root of three. So the sine of uh, seven pi over six comes out to be a negative one half. So I have two times a negative one half. That would be a negative, so I'll write this down, two times a negative one half minus, now this is tricky, I have to go two times seven pi over six. So what happens is those reduce down, so it ends up being seven pi over three. So that means I have to go, that, that is two and one third. So my, it's going to look like this, I have to go around two pi and one third more. So that is square root of three, one and two. So it would be one half. So that comes out to be nasty, right? Uh, so work that out. Uh, we got uh, two times a negative one half would be a negative one minus one. So it'd be negative one and a half, negative three halves. We've got a fire alarm going off. Hold on just a second. All right, sorry about the pause there with the fire alarm. I just had like a 30 minute break here. So I'll see if I can remember what I'm doing. Uh, so we're going to, we got to finish off plugging all these values in, right? We're trying to find out uh, which are going to give us the, the highest y value and the lowest, the max and the min. So we've got the first three done. Uh, let's do 3 pi over 2. So the sine of 3 pi, right? 3 pi over 2 is down here. The sine is a negative 1. So it would be 2 times negative 1 minus cosine, and you got to times a pi over 2 by, 3 pi over 2 by 2. Um, right, so I'm going to go 2 times 3 pi over 2. That would give you a 3 pi, so i got to do the cosine of 3 pi. There's 2 pi, pi puts you over here, which is going to be a negative 1. Um, so we end up with uh, minus negative 1. That's going to change to a plus. So negative 2 plus 1, add those together, and you end up with negative 1 right there. We're almost there, 11 pi over 6. So 11 pi over 6 is all the way around to here. You want to find the sine. So the, this is the 30 degree angle. So the opposite side is negative 1. And the hypotenuse is 2. So it's a negative 1. 2 times a negative 1 half. And then we have uh, minus cosine of. And if you times uh, seven, or, yeah, 7 pi over 6 by 2. Those reduce, ends up being 7 pi over 3. That ends up being, let me erase these, that is 2 and 1 6 pi, 2 and 1 3rd pi, excuse me. So that's 2 and 1 3rd up there. Uh, that is a 60 degree angle. The adjacent side is 1, the hypotenuse is 2. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's a half. So that ends up being, what, negative 1 minus a half would be negative 1 and a half. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, G of 2 pi. So 2 times the sine of 2 pi. 2 pi is all the way around to here. The y coordinate is 0, so it would be 2 times 0 minus the cosine of 4 pi, right? I plug 2 pi in there, I get 2 times 2 pi is 4 pi. That's around twice. But we still end up in that same spot right there. Cosine is the x coordinate, so it would be 1. Uh, so that ends up being negative 1. Whew, a lot of work. Okay, so we look at that. We want to find the max and the min. So the max is the highest point. So the, the largest y value, the highest it ever gets is 3. So we should say it has a max of 3. The lowest it ever gets, and we actually have a tie here. 
it gets down to negative one and a half there and there. Um, and that's okay. If you have two different places where it reaches the same point, it's, it's still your min or max if those are your high or your low point. So we'd say there's a min up at negative three halves. So a lot of work there, like, like a lot of steps, but, but the basic procedure is the same, whether it's those really simple ones we did at the first or this really complicated one here, right? Is first, find your critical numbers. Second, make, take your endpoints and your critical numbers and plug them back in, find all your Y values. Then the last thing is just look at your Y values, the highest ones, your max, the lowest ones, your min. There is a second part to this section. It's the, um, the mean value theorem. I'm going to do that in a separate video just because this one is so long. Um, so I'll attach that one here also. Anyway, that's all I have as far as finding global maximums and global minimums. Thanks, guys.